On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to continue our study on the blessed hope. And the scripture, of course, that comes to mind is Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope has been the mainstay, the uh, primary foundational doctrine uh, to prove imminency or to every generation down through history to encourage God's people to look for the imminent appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture and resurrection. There are some today, however, who are trying to say that imminency was passe, that it was not a doctrine taught to the early church. On today's Prophecy in the News, we want to take a look at imminency and discuss why we're convinced that even though the scriptures teach us of this long period of time, the early church did not understand it. They looked for the imminent return of Christ. The second century likewise, third and so on. Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me the blessed hope. Oh, the blessed hope to the church. And one of the great metaphors of the church in the Bible, J.R., is uh, found in the opening chapters of, Re of Revelation, the seven churches, which are a beautiful prophetic picture. And uh, we, what we really have here is kind of a, a prophetic uh, outline or overview of the church. And many have looked at these seven churches and, and said, well, wait a minute. Here we have in a, in a book written at the close of the first century, a, pro a prophecy that tells us that the church age is going to be a long, long time. That runs counter to the doctrine of imminency, doesn't it? The doctrine of the blessed hope. Well, you know, it's interesting that even though we can look back with hindsight and see the uh, letter to the church of Ephesus being the first century church, Smyrna beginning around 316 A.D., mm -hmm. Pergamos somewhere around the 4th century to the end, Thyatira being somewhere around uh, 500 to 1500, and uh, Sardis, uh, the period of the Reformations in Philadelphia, the period of uh, uh, modern missions. Yes, we can see this 2,000 years of church history flavored in these letters, but in the 1st century they were real churches, and those people did not understand. We have great hindsight, but those people in the early centuries did not have the foresight to understand that this represented a long period of time. Therefore, the Lord could say, for example, to Ephesus, uh, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. <laughs> That's what he wow. said. Yeah. And he said, I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Mm -hmm. And so even to the first century, Jesus had this promise, watch out or I'll come quickly and take your candlestick. Sure, and to the church of Sardis, Revelation 3, 3, he said, remember therefore uh, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. Thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Mm -hmm. So people back in the first and second centuries, the third century reading, uh, this uh, wonderful, albeit shrouded, kind of mysterious picture of the church would say to themselves, you know, Jesus could come at any time. It's, it says, I'm going to come as a thief. You won't know what hour. Watch. Be watching. They would be forced to the conclusion that Jesus could come at that time. Another thing, if any part of the tribulation period must take place before the rapture and resurrection, then that in itself destroys the idea of imminency. For this reason, of course, I'm convinced the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. And even though we are now watching the signs of the times, and we are now convinced that Jesus has not come for, uh, to rapture the saints for the past nearly 2,000 years, that does not mean he will not come because the first century church, the second century, third century, and so on, in each generation watched and looked for the imminent return of Christ. And there was no reason why they should, uh, even though they, there are signs of the times that will attend the events of the end, those signs were not for Gentile Christianity. Yeah. They were for Israel. And uh, the very fact, for example, that the Jews have returned now to their promised land in 1948, 
there were attempts to return to the land several times back over the centuries, but were unsuccessful. However, the church did not always understand that Israel must return. And even those that did, there's no reason to think that they that this destroyed the idea that the Lord could come at any time. Now, this does not mean immediacy. Right. Imminency is not immediacy. In other words, we're not here saying, look out. We are saying that we live holy lives expecting the Lord to return from heaven. We do not know when. It could just be at any time. Mm. Again, uh, reiterating what has to be the key verse for this whole study series, uh, Titus 2.13. Now, Titus was a young pastor. Paul writes him a letter saying, Titus, now this is the kind of pastor I want you to be. And within this letter, we find Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul's saying to Titus, I want you to teach your people to watch for the appearance of Christ. And, and he doesn't say, I want you to watch for the appearance of Christ after this happens or after that happens, mm -hmm. but watch for him to appear. In other words, live watchful lives. So I think this is a very important statement uh, positionally from the, from the view of the pastor. In other words, Titus is a young pastor. He's being urged to teach imminency, if you will. For some time, we've been offering a book uh, through our ministry called Kept from the Hour by Gerald B. Stanton. And uh, in this book, on page 110, he gives the case against imminency. That is, he discusses the idea of some theologians today who think that uh, the second coming, or that is, that the rapture of the church is not imminent. And so he lists some of these objections to the blessed hope. I want to discuss some of those on today's program, Gary. First of all, uh, the fact that Christ promised the coming of the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, seems to indicate that a period of time must occur between Christ's departure and His return, and an imminent return would make the coming of the Spirit a fool's errand. Cool. So wrote Robert Cameron in cool. his book that opposed the idea of imminency. How shall yeah. we answer this question? Well, the comforter, uh, implying a long period of discomfort in which a comforter is needed, I think uh, overlooks the idea that, at the, that even in the day of Jesus and the apostles at that time, there was great opposition, persecution. Uh, within the lifetime of the apostles, J.R., uh, the persecution grew to a, such a degree that most of them were martyred absolutely killed for the witness of Jesus. Uh, there was no long intervening period. Yes. So the comforter was required immediately. Of James and John, who, whose mother asked that they sit one on the right hand, the other on the left of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Though John was the last of the disciples to die, James was the first. And it was not long into the book of Acts until we find James being killed with the sword. That's true. So certainly they needed a comforter, but this did not mean that there would be several generations down the road before the Lord could come back. Mm -hmm. So the idea of the Holy Spirit uh, coming on a fool's errand if the rapture was going to be within that mm -hmm. first century uh, is really a not, not a good way of looking at it. Not at all. Uh, the next objection uh, that, that he discusses is, it has to do with uh, Christ talking to Peter in John chapter 21. Mm -hmm. It seems to me. Uh, yes, in fact, in John 21, uh, the Lord said that Peter would live, you know, to an old age and things like that. But, uh, and so because of that, there are some who say, well, look, Peter is supposed to live till he's white-headed and then mm -hmm. somebody will carry him where he doesn't want to go. And this speaking of the way Peter's going to die. And so the Lord cannot come back until after Peter's death. But you know, first century Christianity didn't know yeah. when Peter would die. That's right. This, yeah. was not, this was not written down. Even though Jesus gave the prophecy, it was not written down until... Uh, many years Close later. Close to the end of the first century before this was actually written by John. Uh -huh. uh, we don't know exactly when, but much later. Yeah. Now, now also, 
we have right after this incident in, in the closing verses of, of John 21, and no doubt this spread by word of mouth. This uh -huh. little story probably was very well known. Uh, Peter turned around and, and he saw John and he said to Jesus, Lord, <clears throat> what shall this man do? This is written in John 21, 21. Implying, well, Lord, uh -huh. tell me a prophecy about what's going to happen in the end of John's life. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus was, uh, gave him a mild reprimand. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. In other that. words, Jesus was saying, you know, I could come back before John dies. That is exactly <laughs> what Jesus was implying there. Sure. Sure. The possibility that he could come back before John dies. Peter would die. He predicted that, sure. but he said John might not die. Right. Indicating the possibility that he could come back for the rapture and resurrection before the end of the first century. Mm. So you see, the, the doctrine of eminency is indeed taught in the scriptures. There is no reason for us to discount that possibility that the Lord could have come at any time. Even though he hasn't, he still can and could have back through the centuries. The fascinating thing is, Gary, there is, there is that Jewish concept that each day of creation represents a thousand years, uh -huh. the six days of creation representing six thousand years, and then the seventh day wherein God rested representing the millennial reign of Christ, uh -huh. the great Sabbath rest. And we're convinced of that today. We've taught on that. Sure. I've written books on the subject. So why did Jesus come at the end of the fourth century if he wasn't supposed to come until the end of the sixth century? Mm. This threw everybody into a little bit of a tizzy, yeah. didn't, didn't it? As a matter of fact, no one foresaw the age of grace, or the, we could call it the age of the Holy Spirit. When yes. the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and indwelt each believer, and uh, for the purpose uh, of calling out a very unique, discreet body of believers. Now we call it the church. Uh -huh. uh, it's really the called out body. And this particular age of the Holy Spirit in which we live, uh, God is doing a mysterious work, J.R., something that was yes. really never prophesied much in the Old Testament. It was obscured, and the apostles then spent all of their time explaining in their writings what this mystery is. It's now been revealed that, that yes. uh, the Holy Spirit is going to behave in a certain way, but the one thing that he left as an open question was, uh, at least to the people in the first century, how long will this age go on. In yes. other words, it's an open-ended age. Now, in the Talmud, in Jewish writings, and they do not believe in Jesus as the Messiah, it was said that the first 2,000 years of history would be characterized by chaos. The second 2,000 years of human history would be the flourishing of the Torah, that is the Mosaic Law. And the third 2,000 years of human history would be the era of the Messiah, and then the final seventh millennium would be the exaltation of the Messiah. Now follow me carefully. 2,000 years of chaos, 2,000 years for the flourishing of the Torah brings us 4,000 years up until Bethlehem mm -hmm. and the opening of the book of Matthew. The Jews themselves wrote, as there were Messianic movements back then, looking for the coming of the Messiah. When he did show up, they just happened to overlook him because they were made spiritually blind and deaf and did not understand who he was. Otherwise, they would not have nailed him to the cross. But they did say the Messianic era should have begun. In fact, in the second century, when this was written in the Talmud, the, the rabbis posed the question, so where is he? Uh -huh. He's supposed to be here by now, so where is the Messiah? And their answer was, he came, but because of our unbelief, he went away. We missed him. Oh. That was written by unbelieving Jewish rabbis, unbelieving meaning they didn't believe in Jesus, in the second century. Uh -huh. 
So even they were looking, even though the seventh millennium would be the exaltation of the Messiah, they were looking for the age of the Messiah for these 2,000 years, which we call the dispensation of grace. Mm -hmm. Which means that even though Jesus went away in Acts chapter 1, he could have come back shortly thereafter to establish this age of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. You know, in Jewish you used a word there, uh, the word dispensation. And this word is often objected to by those who say, uh, we're going to go through at least the first five or so years of the, the seven-year tribulation period uh -huh. and be raptured out at the uh, opening of the seventh seal. And so we're really not looking for the blessed hope, but we're looking for the seals to be opened up. And the church will go through that period as a kind of a purifying time and so forth. They object to the idea of a dispensation of grace, as they call it, or dispensation, dispensationalism in general. But really, you know, that term is a very good biblical term, J.R., and it simply means administration. Mm -hmm. Really, a good modern English rendition of that word is uh, administration. We speak of, uh, you know, the, the Johnson administration, the Nixon administration, the Carter administration, and the Reagan administration. Uh, the presidency goes on, democracy continues, administrations change, and a, with each administration comes a subtle change in the way things are carried out uh, in general. Well, that's a fairly good approximation of the idea of dispensation. In other words, we're under the administration right now of grace, the Holy Spirit, and this body of believers that's being called out in each generation is to be watchful. In other words, this is something that is being taught. That is, can you, the question is, can you be living in, in an attitude of expectancy, mm -hmm. which is really a high statement of faith, in spite of the fact that everything around you says, hey, there's nothing to hope for, you know, it's all going down the tube. Can you live with an attitude of continuing expectancy? And I think this is a very fundamental part of, of where we are as Christians. I believe it's been taught that we should live with an expectancy. There are too many verses of Scripture that tell us uh, uh, to look for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here's another objection that is made by those who do not believe in imminency. The parables of Matthew 13 were intended to reveal truths previously not made known concerning the period between the rejection of Christ by Israel and his return, claiming that these parables set forth the course of this entire age. Uh, Robert Cameron says in his book, Time, Labor, and Many Years of Toil, Growth, and Development in the History of Christendom must precede the Advent. Ooh. How about that, Gary? Well, we know that. <clears throat> we absolutely know that. Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we know that from the benefit of hindsight. Uh, if you go back and read the parables, uh, there is absolutely nothing to keep you from believing that the culmination of those parables could have come in the first century, right? Yes. They could have come like that. We can look back and see that mm -hmm. the parables indeed speak of the kingdom of heaven. Sure. But please understand, they were parables. Another uh, rendering of that um, ancient word translated parables would be riddle. So if the first century listened to these riddles, they didn't understand them. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 9, Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the next verse says, The disciples came to him and said, Why are you speaking to these people in parables? Why don't you speak plainly so they can understand you? And Jesus said, Because it is not given for them to understand. For they, you see, have eyes and cannot see, ears and cannot hear. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah saying, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. Mm. So the parables were not to be opened, but to be closed. Mm -hmm. They were riddles. And speaking of parables, uh, we have several parables uh, scattered throughout the New Testament uh, that concern usually a landowner or a nobleman who goes on a long journey. Okay. And he mm -hmm. has people do things while he's gone. Yeah, parable of the talents. Yeah, talents. Uh, here's one uh, in Luke 19, 12, the parable of the, the pounds, uh, where it says, a certain nobleman went into a far country 
<clears throat> to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Well, within this parable, uh, he assigns responsibility to people, and the implication is he's going to be gone for a long time. The, the criticism here is that if he's going to be gone for a long time, that destroys the doctrine of imminency. Jesus is contradicting himself. Yes. But you see, when he came back, those same men were still alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he came back in their lifetimes, That's, didn't he? That is exactly That right. long time didn't mean mm -hmm. their children or grandchildren were the ones he was going to come and uh, uh, make an accounting with. Mm -hmm. So That raises the question, how long is a long time? Yes. <laughs> it could have been within their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Remember, Jesus said, I might come back before John dies. He said it, folks. That's right. That's imminency. Uh, any way you want to look at it, that's imminency. Well, let's take another one here. Yeah. Um, the parable of the nobleman who went into a far country. We've talked about that yeah. one, haven't we? Right. Uh, then there's the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and mm -hmm. 20. Implies a long interval of time and that there is not the slightest reason for assuming that an unnamed Jewish company converted after the rapture but before the millennium could complete the accomplishment of this task. The Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Well, you know, there's an answer to that, too. And that is that the Great Commission happened with astonishing speed. Paul writes in Colossians 1, 6 uh, concerning the gospel, um, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard it. Paul is speaking here in, to the Colossians. He's writing this letter and saying the gospel is in all the world. Well, there's yeah. a fulfillment of the Great Commission right there because Paul knows how quickly these emissaries spread about through the Roman Empire, and yes. it wasn't very long at all. In fact, the Apostle Paul was accused of turning the whole world upside down. Yes, he was. And so the first century would have been easier to reach than, say, today. Uh, the more, for example, the more people who are being born, and there, there are people being born more today than there have been in ever, ever before. It's more difficult today to reach the world than it was in the first century. Absolutely. Uh, for example, when cities become so large, then uh, uh, wickedness uh, erupts in the cities. We see so much wickedness today because there are so many people, and we have not been able to get to everybody with the gospel and win them and get them straightened out and let them live right. Well, this doctrine of eminency then is absolutely a fascinating one and is taught to the first century.